Johnny Vedmore. That's me. Hi. We're going to go through um, one of my series today. We're going to start off. It's the first of the series, so you know it's only a, a limited number of series one man can have written already by this point. So I got the Youngerman series, of course, the Pottinger series. I got the Black Hand series, the Schwab series. I got Data Diving series. A couple other bits and bobs here. I suppose I've got a couple other little mini series here and there. Stanley Setti is a double two parter. The murder of Stanley Setti will go through that eventually. But um this one is part one of and we should we should go in without any further ado. We should get into it and we should get talking about it. Um so the first thing that I do whenever I'm going to um show you an Important article. Yes, I said it. <laughs> it's take you to my screen share. Hello and welcome, people. Welcome to newspaste.com. Um, because of a financial constraints, I'm trying to work out what I need to do. Maybe I need to merge johnnyvedmore.com and newspaste so that you go to the same site anyway. But this is newspaste, and they roughly have the same information set up in multiple different ways, slightly different. So I think they need to be merged eventually. But I've changed the top screen of newspaste to make it easier for people to find previous series. As you see, you've got home, you've got post, and you've got support so that you could do those things. You could become a patron. You, you could buy me a coffee. These things are things you could do. You could actually give me a WordPress plan so that um, I can pay for the site uh, and make sure that I constantly can bring you read-throughs and the like. So I said we've been through some parts of the Schwab read through. I actually did when Kissinger died. I did the Kissinger continuum. Um, and the other parts, other people have done very well. Alex Thompson does a brilliant read through of Schwab family values. And um, and then other people did read throughs of Dr. Klaus Schwab or how the CFR taught me to stop worrying and love the bomb, including a certain comedian who's very good, uh, John F. O'Donnell. John F. Donnell, O'Donnell, O'Donnell. Anyway, um, and then there's a Pottinger series. We've done the read-throughs for the Pottinger series. As you see, they're in the drop-down menu here. And Youngerman series, we've done the read-throughs for the first three parts of the Youngerman series. The Daniel Korski part will come too soon. And Black Hand, we've done number one, but we haven't done the next four. And these ones really, really fun. Those are really fun. And I, it's missing a couple of the articles here, but I've done read-throughs of... Um, did you read through of Pablo Milo or did I do a news hound? Well, we'll find out. Uh, David Shaw there, the genetics of Bill Gates. We did a read-through of that and a welcome five on the last couple. Uh, who is Barbara Hewson? Uh Theresa May's connection with uh, Pafafa's connection with a, a serial killer. We did a read through of that. The father, the son, and the Mencius Mobug will be doing a read through of very soon. And there's a few more down there as well, who was Barbara Hewson and others. But today we're going over here. Yes, we are. We're going to Epstein 101. And these I adapted from the parts I wrote for uh, and researched for Whitney Webb's One Nation Under Blackmail. I sent her basically um, what was uh, two large chapters and uh, did a load of other research and other things as well, about 30,000 words in total maybe more actually no more with the wax and stuff and so so um not all of it was used um and some of it then i decided the stuff that wasn't used and didn't go out for whatever reason i decided to form into what was called the epstein 101 series uh so this was for one nation under blackmail um and uh this series has been adapted so i i wrote this whole series afterwards i added to it um i also put in some parts that i thought were 
um, necessary to understand too. I don't really need these headphones on. I know that. I can understand that for sure. So this first part, thank you for joining me. This first part of the Epstein 101. It's called The Lure, Grooming and Seduction. And it's by me, Johnny Vedmore. And it's via Newspaste Originals, which is the site, newspaste.com, my site. If the first part of this series, in the first part of this series, straight away, I should stop, shouldn't I? Quick smoke, a drink. Maybe I should comment on this picture here. You see this picture? Get a bit bigger as well. This picture here, of course, is not a real picture. I took her out. I put her around the one where Epstein's got his arm out over a couch looking all cool and that seemed like a perfect picture to go alongside it and it really it really fit in it's a fit into what we see epstein and maxwell is like like these young unruly upstarts is bonnie and clyde of the sexual compromise business with her father's face lurking in the picture too <clears throat> it's um it's a real i i I've, i think it's one of the the best bits of graphics and the easiest bits of graphics that I've made just to put together that easily. It was just those two pictures. And then you've got this. Hmm. Like I say, very much like the Bonnie and Clyde of the um, sexual compromise rather than blackmail. We'll get into that in this series, the difference between um, blackmail and other forms of coercion. Epstein 101, The Lure, Grooming and Seduction. In the first part of this series, we'll examine the criminal profile of the notorious intelligence-linked pedophile Jeffrey Epstein and his main accomplices. We'll also study the selection process and techniques which Maxwell and Epstein adopted to successfully lure, groom and seduce their young targets. Note well, this series was adapted from notes which I... Uh, made while helping with the research for One Nation Under Blackmail, Volume 2 by Whitney Webb. Let me just uh, move my own screen a little bit smaller there so I can see all the letters. In among the maelstrom of varying intelligence operations that Epstein and Maxwell were involved in running at any one time, any one time, the majority of public attention has focused on the duo's grooming of minors for sexual exploitation. Indeed, throughout the 1990s and until around 2005, Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell ran one of the most sophisticated and unique child trafficking operations ever documented. The operation, which targeted children and young women, was implemented subtly, and the complex enterprise was more nuanced than U.S. law enforcement agencies such as the FBI had encountered previously. In fact, while Epstein and Maxwell were beginning their many operations involving the trafficking of children and young girls, the FBI profiling methods, which were designed to identify such offenders, were only in their infancy, developmentally speaking. The word grooming may be a term which is verily used today when describing the entire process offenders use to manipulate their chosen victims, but in actuality, grooming is a term which has only been in regular use when referring to child sexual exploitation since around the 1980s. The use of the term grooming in relation to the abuse and manipulation of children is also often misunderstood by many people outside law enforcement and is in fact designed to describe just one part of a multi-stage process of organized child sexual exploitation. In modern times, it is a term which is often misused to generalize the entire process of what are essentially two different acts the initial luring of a child victim and the grooming and or seduction of the victim. The term grooming does not apply to violent crimes against children which are perpetrated by strangers. For instance, the offering of sweets to a child before an abductor would to kidnap their victim is not classified as a grooming technique but instead the classic, a, a classic example of a lure. Grooming generally refers to specific techniques used by some child molesters to gain access to and keep control of their child victims. 
The techniques a child molester employs are mostly influenced by the relationship between the offender and the victim. In an article from 1984 published in Social Service Review entitled The Justice System and Sexual Abuse of Children, the author, John Conte, describes the process of grooming accurately, stating, The perpetrator involves children in sexual abuse through a grooming process in which a combination of kindness, attention, material enticement, special privilege and coercion are expertly applied. Conte added a footnote linking, linking his own 1984 description to a 1979 book by Nicholas Groff entitled Men Who Rape, The Psychology of the Offender, which had been published by Plenum Press. Until 1987, most training seminars and official FBI programs didn't refer to this specific behavior as grooming, but instead they termed these actions as being part of the process of seduction. These are two facts which become very apparent to anyone who has thoroughly investigated the Epstein controversy. Firstly, without the grooming and exploitation of children aspect to the case, the majority of their other crimes would have probably gone largely unnoticed. And, secondly, all of their other crimes became inextricably linked to the grooming and sexual abuse of unsuspecting young female victims. The act of grooming a child may seem like a very specific criminal trait, but Epstein and Maxwell also applied their grooming skills to adults, specifically people in power who had a weakness for forbidden fruit. Epstein and Maxwell were compulsive in their exploitative behavior towards children, but they were also willing to exploit any human regardless of age to meet their operational goals. Whilst exploiting naive adults is something most people in society can suffer and tolerate to a large extent, the exploitation of children is an unforgivable act, which has made the Epstein case so well-renowned. In examining the criminal behavior of Epstein and Maxwell, it's clear that they were guilty of abusing vulnerable girls, but depending on how the individual victims reacted to that abuse, they enacted different strategies to best utilize that person further. They were experts in normalizing completely outrageous behavior, and their deviant advances on their young victims and their target's initial response didn't seem to deter them from squeezing the most potential out of each of their quarry. To understand this seemingly sadistic bent which Maxwell and Epstein showed towards their young victims and how they could groom so many young girls to a point where those victims had become veritable sex slaves, one must first understand the category of sexual offender which fits the criminal profiles of Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. In basic criminal profiling terms, Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein fit comfortably in the category of sadistic preferential child molesters. This simply means that as paedophiles, they have a sexual preference for children above adults, and that the relationship they form with their victims is based on sadistic control, coercion, and is essentially just a way to exert power over another human who is more vulnerable or naive due to their age and or experience. Sadistic preferential paedophiles are the most dangerous category of paedophile and are also the rarest. One of the ways in which sadistic preferential paedophiles differ to most other paedophiles is that they are likely to engage in a longer and more complex grooming process. Epstein and Maxwell's grooming operation began properly in the 1990s and the majority of organizational aspects of these criminal activities were headed by Maxwell herself. Most criminal paedophile behavior experienced within society is committed not by preferential paedophiles like Epstein and Maxwell, but are instead acts by criminals who are most often better categorized as situational paedophiles. Situational paedophiles will normally maintain typical sexual relationships with other adults, but situational pressure in their life will see them offend, often by downloading paedophile imagery and movies and storing them in a disorganized fashion. Preferential paedophiles are much more aware of the social taboo surrounding their actions and are more likely to be extremely organized, hiding their actions whenever possible. 
Epstein and Maxwell, although themselves probably best classified as sadistic preferential pedophiles, understood the sexual dynamics and the wild proclivities of their targets for influence and compromise operations. These marks were often mix, a mix of wealthy people who were all situated in pressure cooker-like big business environments or affiliated to very stressful major political institutions or roles. Epstein and Maxwell used all of their skills and abilities to compromise these targets so they could later be manipulated into taking actions which were normally perceived as against the target's own best interests. When you examine the constituent parts of Epstein and Maxwell's industrial grooming operation, you discover that not all of the members of their team were preferential pedophiles. Instead, their group were a, mix, a complex mix of enablers, completely complicit co-conspirators, unwitting brainwashed victims, grafting opportunists, as well as the completely naive and innocent-minded. This same mix of characters also appears to be true for many of Max, Epstein and Maxwell's targets of their various compromise operations. There were many people who were briefly exposed to Epstein and Maxwell's organization and, once they saw what was really happening behind closed doors, swiftly distanced themselves from the pair. But there were also many others who knew every single detail of what was happening to the children and young girls groomed by these prolific sex offenders and who would con continue to assist them regardless. Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein were experts in running a multitude of complicated, multifaceted, multifaceted operations simultaneously. As offenders, they were often found to be operating in a range of environments and at each, uh, each particular base of operations, they were regularly propagating more than one criminal endeavor at any one time. Epstein and Maxwell were often more cunning than regular people can really grasp. Separately, they were experts in understanding effective tactics for manipulating their targets. But when they joined forces, they became almost unstoppable, using every underhand technique to meet their many sinister ends. For instance, in the late 1990s and through the turn of the millennium, Southern Bee's auction house in New York became a fantastic base for various operations involving Ghislaine Maxwell in particular where one could be so innocent and naive to think that Maxwell was simply passionate art lover treading the carpets of Sotheby's auction house in New York looking no for nothing more than a good deal, the reality was much more complex and sinister. Ghislaine wasn't a regular at Sotheby's events just to get a discount Dali, but rather the structure of Sotheby's was designed in such a way that allowed for Maxwell to be extremely influential. Within Sotheby's during this period, the elite and wealthy players in society, who the likes of Epstein and Maxwell fed off, were busy competing among themselves to scoop up a deal during the prolonged period of exploding art prices. This access to the elite was exactly what Epstein and Maxwell's wider operation relied on. But this isn't all Glane had to assist her at Sotheby's. Sotheby's was under the leadership of megagroup grandee A. Alfred Taubman and Les Wexner, who had both been close allies of Robert Maxwell. Also working at Sotheby's during this period was Maxwell and Epstein's close friend, Tiffany Dubin, who was the head of the fashion department at the auction house. These significantly powerful allies made Sotheby's a very controllable environment. There have also, also always been severe restrictions around photography at the major auction houses, leaving whatever happened behind closed doors to remain there. This secretive nature of the major art auction houses such as Sotheby's and Christie's during this period allowed for Ghislaine Maxwell to commit one type of crime in, in particular, which was a speciality of the perverted duo, grooming. Right, there you go, is Alfred Taubman, member of the mega group alongside Les Wexner and Rob Maxwell and others. Standing outside Sotheby's, estimated 1744. <clears throat> Even though Epstein and Maxwell 
worked with in many different shady areas, nearly all of their activities included some sort of grooming. The venues frequented by the wealthy New York elite were perfect places for Epstein and Maxwell to recruit potential collaborators, network with well-connected establishment players, all potential targets for their influence and compromise operations. But these havens for the rich were also perfect places for Maxwell to find young aspiring female artists, which she often referred to as gallerinas. These young ladies, who can be considered as prime targets of Ghislaine Maxwell and her billionaire pederast boyfriend, were often unassuming, talented young women who were looking for a break in the art business, which made them fantastically easy game for wealthy and well-connected predators like Maxwell. By the time Maxwell had coined the term gallerinas, this group had evolved their grooming operation quite significantly. Many of their targets for sexual exploitation were not only talented young women who had been lured into the proverbial lion's den. Much of Maxwell's operations is much more reminiscent of a cliched, but unfortunately often true, image of a dirty old man offering sweets to children at a school gates. Epstein was key to grooming the wealthy and elite through sexual compromise and influence operations, but for that exploitation of young girls to occur, he required human fuel for their perverted fireplace. Ghislaine Maxwell was the person who was tasked with heading up the operation to identify and groom children and vulnerable young girls for the powerful elites to exploit and abuse, but Maxwell was also tasked with supplying herself and Jeffrey Epstein with a regular throw of vulnerable girls they could exploit and abuse also. During that experience, the victims all enacted various coping mechanisms to deal with their abuse. One of the main things that Maxwell and Epstein were looking for were girls who could be manipulated into participating into a range of further activities. They only met their evil ends by going through the known and study techniques associated with the despicable crime of child sexual exploitation. Let's break down the stages that Maxwell and Epstein used to capture, coerce, control and manipulate their victims. Firstly, as is, commonly known, as is common knowledge, any predator must initially attack their prey. Attract, sorry. Attract, to attack. The Lua. In the United States, luring a minor for sexual exploitation is a class three felony, and if the minor is under 15 years of age, it is supposed to be considered an even more serious crime. The luring of young girls in order for them to be sexually exploited is the, ex uh, the um, initial stage of a very long and sinister process of human control and coercion. Jeffrey Epstein's standard operation mainly revolved around a female proxy offering a potential young victim financial incentives in return for a simple massage. The initial massage usually became a coercive and forceful grooming technique, and afterwards extra money was offered to the victim if they could successfully recruit other girls from their schools or individual friendship groups, often from the poorer areas of West Palm Beach, uh, west of Palm Beach. If the girls didn't manage to immediately extricate themselves effectively from this cabal of wealthy paedophiles and their main, many enablers, then they usually became the beneficiaries of further more complex lures, which may include various gifts, opportunities to travel to far off places, and even in some cases, an entire education. These lures act as further incentives meant to suck their targets deeper into a twisted cycle of sexual abuse and leaving them to feel, in essence, entirely owned by their wealthy captors. In the 2021 criminal case against Ghislaine Maxwell, minor victim four, who was testifying under her first name, Carolyn, was a Florida victim of Jeffrey Epstein, who was sexually abused by him up to three times a week for several years. Caroline would testify that Ghislaine Maxwell routinely called her to schedule massages and eventually invited the young girl to Epstein's private island. Carolyn was only 14 when Epstein began to abuse her, and she received a few hundred dollars after giving Epstein a massage that finished with the perverted billionaire masturbating while he touched her. Carolyn told the court, I was young, and $300 was a lot of money to me. 
She also testified that Epstein molested her more than 100 times between 2001 and 2004 at his Palm Beach mansion. Once Carolyn was inside the group, she was offered further financial incentives by Epstein, Maxwell and their close collaborators to engage in other sexual behaviour. Carolyn testified that Sarah Kellen snapped nude photos of her in order, on the orders of Jeffrey Epstein whilst there was no one else present. She told the court that she had received a phone call from Kellen who told her that she would get paid 500 to $600 if she was allowed to take further nude photographs of her. Epstein eventually pressurized Carolyn into bringing him younger friends and she recruited three girls who were approximately the same age as she was at the time. She told the court in 2021 that she was paid $600 for luring in other victims. Carolyn would also tell the court that Epstein had asked me if I had any friends my age or younger. She responded on that occasion by telling the Peter Paul billionaire, I don't hang out with younger people, but I have some friends I can ask. The act of giving these vulnerable young girls from the poorer parts of town money, gifts and opportunities which were other, otherwise unavailable to them was not only a successful technique to attract new blood to the operation, but it would also prime the victims with a powerful psychological fallacy. After the girls had been abused and had received enough incentives, they often got caught in a simple fallacy trap, believing that they were in too deeply they were too deeply involved to uh, complain or get away from their captors, with most seeing themselves as complicit. With a false sense of responsibility instilled in their victims, Epstein and Maxwell had successfully captured hold of their lure. A very well-documented example of how Maxwell used a stereotypical lure to recruit vulnerable girls is that of the much-maligned Haley Robson. Robson, sorry. Haley was a vulnerable young girl who was in college when she was first offered a lucrative opportunity for such a young girl. The New York Times reported that Haley Robson was a 16-year-old high school student when she was approached by an acquaintance in Palm Beach Swimming Pool. Her friend asked her if she wanted to make money giving massages to a local billionaire. At the time, Robson was a Palm Beach Community College student from near Lock Hatchley. <laughs> Lock Hatchley. And she soon had her first experience of Jeffrey Epstein's wandering hands. Although Robson dismissed Epstein's advances very early on, showing her assertiveness, she had obviously also impressed Epstein in some other way, and she was soon offered more lucrative opportunity. This was the moment in which Haley Robson began to be groomed and coerced into recruiting other, girl, uh, other local girls. Haley was later accused of rounding up dozens of high school girls from impoverished rural populations just outside the Palm Beach area for Epstein and Maxwell. Robson received $200 payment for each new masseuse she brought to Epstein's home. According to police reports, court papers suggest, uh, according to police reports, court papers suggest that Epstein thought that young Miss Robson targeting these girls from poorer area brought the operation less attention and that any potentially distressed victims were less likely to go to the authorities. In a later court deposition, Haley stated, I didn't have to convince them. I proposed to them. They took it. In October 2020, it was reported in OK Magazine that police interviews from the time of Haley Robson's initial arrest in 2005 suggested that she truly believed she was helping them by setting up these appointments with Epstein. Although she claimed complete innocence, Robson also famously compared herself to the so-called Hollywood Madam Heidi Fleiss during one interview with Palm Beach Police. She also said to the police that she was told off by Epstein for bringing back a woman of 23 with the detective noting that Robson had been told by Epstein, the younger the better. Haley Robson during her appearance as part of Ep Jeffrey Epstein's Filthy Rich dodgy documentary in my opinion each individual that maxwell and epstein recruited into the wider op their wider operations had their own individual experience of being groomed 
Maxwell and Epstein reacted fluidly when grooming young girls using responsive and adaptive techniques tailor-made for their individual targets. Haley Robson had refused Epstein's advances very early on, which had showed courage, but she was still a vulnerable young girl whose brain had not yet formed enough to understand the true gravity of the situation in which she had become embroiled. She wasn't perceived as a candidate for further sexual grooming or to be used in compromise or influence operations. Instead, the spunky young lady was groomed by Maxwell and Epstein to become a recruiter and to bring them further victims. Haley Robson eventually got much criticism for her actions, and while some of what she did could be seen as entirely complicit, children and young people can easily be installed with a false sense of moral and ethical values by people who they admire or who they see as appropriate senior role models. Haley Robson was groomed to recruit with a classic lure of cash and other rewards, but some were groomed for a range of more clandestine and secretive operations. Epstein and Maxwell created an entire alternative reality within their various bases of operations. Epstein's Palm Beach property became an opaque bu bubble of immoral and unethical control, where the abuse of young girls had been normalized. The offer of $200 to a young teenage girl for bringing their school friends into this criminal enterprise cannot be undervalued as a powerful tactic. Further victims have testified to their own abuse at the hands of Epstein and Maxwell, having begun when they received a note in class or in a school, in a school playground. Um, and by the time each one of those girls had crossed over the threshold of Epstein's Palm Beach residence, they'd leave instilled with a feeling of shame and firmly holding on to a secret that they'd be unlikely to ever reveal. Although offering money to young girls who were from poorer communities paid major dividends in relation to the successful recruitment of young victims, other victims were offered opportunities instead of cash rewards. Most of them never materialized. A court testimony from 2021, a survivor referred to as Jane Doe 11 stated, he promised me that he would write me a letter of recommendation for Harvard if I got the grades and scores needed for a mission. He, his word was worth a lot, he assured me, as he was in the midst of funding and leading Harvard's study on human brain. And the president was his friend. Mm -hmm. Epstein, once in a locked room with the aforementioned witness, threatened to kill her and then raped her. Marik Shatouni also testified to having a similar experience of being lured into Epstein's orbit of influence by Glenn Maxwell, stating, She told me he went to Cooper's Union. He was a mathematical genius, that he had favourite girls, that he would take her to Chanel for 15-minute all-you-can-buy shopping trips. She told me his right-hand person had connections to the arts and fashion world, and she could help me. Many victims of Jeffrey Epstein were not lured into these situations via low-level recruitment efforts seen in such places as the poorer area of West Palm Beach. Some were also lured through much more sophisticated overlapping operations in much more high-class settings. The child sexual exploitation operations, which was run by Epstein and Maxwell, didn't only target local teenagers of Palm Beach or the young gallerinas of New York. The operation was global. One of the young girls who was a victim of Epstein was also one of the people who would be later accused of being a willing accomplice. Ma Nadia Masinkova was a Yugoslavian teen who became known as Epstein's personal sex slave and assistant, but in Nadia's case, there appeared to be no lure involved. It is widely reported that Marcinkova had been purchased by the paedophile billionaire. It is almost impossible to contemplate the reality of what Nadia Marcinkova had to endure and how that affected her behaviour afterwards. But she has also... Um, been accused of participating in sex acts by some of Epstein's other victims. Police records suggest that investigators had indications that Marcinkova could be, have been underage herself when she was purchased by Epstein. 
Marcinkova later changed her name to Marcinko and declined to answer questions about Epstein's abuse of girls when she was dis deposed in a lawsuit, choosing to evoke the Fifth Amendment. Maxwell and Epstein, as extremely wealthy and powerful people, had many different means at their disposal to aid them in luring young girls from all different walks of life. But regardless of their ability to attract a wide range of girls, there were one group of young women who were always easiest to enslave. That vulnerable group which I speak of are those young girls who had already previously experienced abuse. It is hard for anyone to effectively overcome the experience of being groomed for sexual exploitation, yet let alone the experience of being sexually abused or raped. Many people who have previously been groomed and abused by paedophiles are considered as being psychologically primed for potential further abuse. Once someone has been abused for a prolonged period of time, they begin to enact both conscious and unconscious coping mechanisms to manage the heightened stress and fear levels they experience. Once these survivors are exposed to further abuse in the future, they can easily slip back into automatic psychological avoidance mechanisms which their psyche have enacted previously. One of the most prominent and vocal Epstein survivors, Virginia Robert, Roberts Gouffray, or Gouffray Roberts, had already been a victim of um, child abuse and was the perfect target for elite paedophiles. Virginia Roberts was only 16 years old when she claims to have first been lured by the offer of a career from Ghislaine Maxwell while she was working in the locker room, as a locker room assistant at Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago Resort in Florida. She has said that she was desperate for the opportunity which could provide her with security and stability. She had longed for all through her childhood. The stability she had longed for, for all through her childhood. Maxwell and Epstein took advantage of this eagerness which Virginia showed to forge a better life and they lured her into a situation where they could begin to abuse her. The human psyche deals with unresolved sexual, physical or psychological abuse in, in ways many of us can never understand. When someone has experienced prolonged systematic abuse, they often, to the frustration of everyone who cares for them, return to the abuser. This also applies to someone who is abused by more than one person in their life. Quite simply, people who have unresolved experience of previous abuse are statistically much more likely to gravitate towards being in another b abusive relationship. Some of those people never manage to struggle free of this cycle of abuse, while some go on to act out their own trauma on others. Epstein and Maxwell used various lures to coax each of their young victims into their circles. But for some of the victims, the real lure was a false sense of security which came from being within an abusive relationship. And Epstein and Maxwell had plenty of abuse to go around. The second part of the Epstein 101 series, we'll learn about the victims and some of their testimony relating to Maxwell and Epstein's use of grooming techniques. And here are the sources. Um, because I was uh, writing it with, for uh, One Nation Under Blackmail, I kept all the sources maintained in very classic source format. Um, so this was what, what I was asked, how I was asked to... Um, keep it and so i've uh I made sure these are all shared as well like i say a lot of this wasn't um wasn't there but uh wasn't um included some of this wasn't included in the book so it's useful to know where it did come from you can at the end of all of these i mean you the support page will give you other opportunities but if you just want to support me in a different way just scan and support you can become a patron buy me a coffee is really useful really useful for me um and becoming a patron is really useful of course uh, i need help seriously um <laughs> i don't know quite how i'm gonna keep going i keep saying that but that's because that's how it is uh but this is part one of a series which is um of course 
gives you a fundamental understanding of certain parts of the Epstein and Maxwell's operation. And this first part was really about um, the lure grooming and seduction. And what that would, that was what a lot of their most famous enterprise was built on luring young girls, grooming them, and then getting something back from that, you know, their input and output. And these, they, they were young when they started this off, they were young and they developed their technique. They were younger and they developed their techniques very well. And it is like um, truly a modern intelligence Bonnie and Clyde operation. I, I think even though, even though it's, it's obviously they got connections to uh, CIA, uh, MI5, MI6, um, Israeli intelligence, they got links to it all. Um, they they were based in America. That can't be understated. The Americans knew what was going on the entire time, and a lot of the people who worked with them were CIA. So it was clear that they were they were in in the loop. So that is the first of the um of the Epstein one hundred and one read throughs. <laughs> And um, some of the, some, of course, with read through, some of them will be shorter, some of them will be longer. So I'm not quite sure how long this is run to at the moment. Uh, I would think it's between 45 minutes and an hour. Um, but the, at the Welcome Trust one I did last was um, 15,000 words, and that took two hours to read through. So. Uh, please like, share, subscribe, you know, the, the, the usual, but also um, support my work. I need support. I am completely independent. I can only make this sort of work if I am remain independent. Um, if you want to ask me anything, my DMs are open on various platforms. Best get me on, easiest to get me on Twitter, um, X. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed that. Join me again for another Johnny Redmore read for at some point. I will appreciate your presence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A new generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Brazil, of uh, Argentina and so on, certainly penetrates the cabinets.